This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is humor, what it is, how it developed, what makes something funny, what makes something unfunny. And I have two, possibly three guests if I'm lucky. Uh, uh, Ari Hoffman, a stand-up comedian, and Sal Tarda, who has written on the subject quite extensively. And the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is humor. I have a couple of guests who are going to be talking about uh, humor. And uh, I'd like to give all my guests a few minutes to introduce themselves. So the man on the left is Ari Hoffman. He's a stand-up comedian, an actor that I've known for quite a few years. It's been a long time since I've spoken with him, though. Uh, so Ari, if you could give a little background about who you are, uh, uh, you know, how you became a stand-up comedian, your ideas on comedy, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, well, uh, I have two careers that I balance. I'm a, a, a German teacher, German instructor, German lecturer at the University of Minnesota, and have been since my hair was black. Um, and uh, I'm also a, 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 I'm a comedian. I do uh, sort of a, I guess you'd call it more theatrical comedy, more sketches, more presentational. Uh, maybe I'll get into that a little later. I, I'm not quite... Uh, this, I don't want to put myself in a special class, but not quite regular uh, stand-up comedian that maybe you yeah. would see on, uh, uh, well, I'll get into it. And uh, anyway, these two careers have brought me all of this. Uh, I'm sitting here uh, in front of a water heater, and that's that's, that's where it's got me. And a nice water heater it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Sal, Sal Latardo is my uh, other guest. Uh, hopefully we might have someone uh, else joining us. But uh, Sal, if you could give a little background about yourself, the book that you've written, uh, uh, and any other ideas that you have on what humor is. Yes. Well, um, I'm an academic, uh, so this is going to be the boring part of the video, which I hope you can then edit out. Um, so uh, I've written actually several books uh, on, on humor, linguistics, which is my uh, field on the linguistics of humor. Um, they're all bestsellers. Um, the, in fact, you know, sort of expect a Hollywood movie to come out uh, uh, of, of them very soon, um, I'm sure. Um, I've actually uh, edited the Encyclopedia of Humor Studies, uh, which came out uh, four or five years ago. Um, and uh, I was editor-in-chief of uh, the Humor Journal for 10 years. Ah, we've just been joined by our third guest here. So uh, uh, Mitch Earlywine is uh, is uh, back online here. Uh, so uh, Sal, are you finished with your introduction? Uh, I was done. Okay. Uh, Mitch, glad to have you back. Uh, Ari Hotman and uh, Sal Atado have given a little brief pricey of who they are. If you could uh, do similarly, give a little bit of uh, background about who you are, anything you've written on the subject of humor. Oh, well, I'm honored to be mentioned in the same breath as these guys. I came to the game a little bit late, but I'm the author of Humor 101. Uh, I was a stand-up comic in the late 90s. I'm a professor at the University uh, at Albany State University of New York, and I've uh, basically published that one book and experienced comedy sort of live in the, in the world of stand-up. But uh, other than getting me a few teaching awards, I do not have the publications these guys have. I'm just delighted to be here. Well, let me just start out. I don't want to start out with asking what humor is because everyone's going to have a slightly different definition. But let me just ask uh, if any of you have uh, researched the idea of how humor evolved in the human mind. Um, I've always thought it's uh, intimately connected with uh, violence or, or cruelty in that, you know, you slip on a banana, see someone fall on their ass and you laugh. Uh, it, it, do you think that humor was sort of a response uh, to sort of tone down aggressiveness from these kinds of mishaps that instead of uh, beating someone up that we sort of laughed at it. Uh, uh, anyone who wants to jump in, go ahead. I, well, I, I think, I think so. I think the idea probably of, of having, you know, compassion for someone who slips on a banana peel, that might be a newer, that might be, that idea might be newer than we want to think. Um, <laughs> So the idea of laughing at, I personally, I, I uh, the way I ra the way I was raised, even if it's the if it's Fatty Arbuckle slipping on a banana peel, I mean no, and no one could slip on a banana peel like Fatty Arbuckle, let me tell you. But I, for me, I always think, oh my gosh, that poor guy, he must be hurt. Yeah. But I think probably 
what you're saying is right. I think it's a lot. Of, it's it's a. Uh, uh, I went to a lecture on um, on uh, laughter in Germanic society. Unfortunately, I came late, so I don't have too much to say. But things like laughing at, at misfortune, laughing at deformity, laughing at the deformities of of uh, got in, uh, that were acquired in battle. So I think I think I don't know about exclusively uh aggression but certainly more than we would like to admit that's what i got to say mitch or sal do you have a comment on that well um I, i'm always um, i'm always uh, reluctant to to talk about um, uh, evolution uh because the truth is nobody has absolutely any clue whatsoever um where humor or anything else like that uh, uh, came from if you look at the earliest recorded uh, samples that we have, uh, which is, uh, you know, Babylonian humor and Egyptian humor, um, it's exactly identical to today's humor. Uh, mm -hmm. In, you know, uh, there are some um, uh, uh, pictograms on, on, you know, Egyptian tombs that you could translate into a Dilbert cartoon and it would work exactly the same, you know. Um, the earliest recorded joke is about farting, and uh, you know those jokes are quite popular. So, you know, it, it's hard to say that humor has evolved in any in any way. Now, you know, what Ari was saying is very true: is that you have certain subjects that are acceptable for humor, and then they become unacceptable for humor. So during the Middle Ages, making fun of people with physical deformities like uh, uh, dwarves and uh, hunchbacks or whatever was considered great, fantastic. It was a professional uh, career for people with physical handicaps to be a jester. Yeah. Uh, well, try making fun of, of people with physical handicaps today. Well, okay, so you might become president, but other than that, <laughs> it's on the pawn in polite society, right? So you know that's uh, so so you get uh, these changes in um, in what is acceptable, but the the roots of 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 what is funny and what is humor, they don't seem to change across mm -hmm. documented history. You know, then we start going into you know the primates, and uh, you know uh, that becomes very very dodgy uh, evidence and and, and argument. Um, you know. Who knows exactly where 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 those things uh, came from? Um, from what we can say, where we have sort of hard evidence, you know, written documents, that kind of that kind of thing, it, it was already there. All of it. You get the the aggression, you get the incongruity, you get the relief. It's all there already from the oldest uh, documented sources that we have. Well, I was just going to ask Mitch, but it looks like you dropped out again. Hopefully, he'll pop up in a minute. But uh, let's try. Can, can, can I just add one yeah. thing? You mentioned farting. Uh, yeah. My uh, academic advisor wrote a an article. This is a man with a long list of credits, and he wrote a uh, of of of, uh, of articles, and he wrote a, one called uh, "Gone with the Wind: More Thoughts on Medieval Farting." <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, Ari, you had mentioned Fatty Arbuckle, and uh, it brought yeah. to mind Charlie Chaplin, because I've often argued with people, the three big silent film comedians were Chaplin, Keaton, and uh, Harold Lloyd, and I've always thought that despite the latter-day dissing of Chaplin, that he was by far the, the most, the best of the comics, and be because he could bring more to, than just the humor. Having said that, I think the early Tramp that was cruel was funnier than the Tramp of City Lights and so forth. Um, because he was cruel. Do you would you agree with that, Ari? Well, I, I think they're 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 probably. I, I grew up in a household where where uh, Chaplin was um, uh, there was a lot of talk about Chaplin, and so there were there was really early Chaplin, which was very slapstick, which was very key, uh, it was in the Keystone Studio, so it was um, uh, he was just sort of the the guy doing. Uh, regular comedy, but you could tell there was something really special about him. And then he develops into this sort of combination of slapstick and and uh, the, the slapstick artist, but with a heart. But I think once you get into the later ones, he 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 sort of sees. I think Chaplin began at some point to see, oh, 
gosh, I'm doing something very special here, which may have been a, that may have been a problem uh, once you realize, oh, hey, this is, you know, I've, I'm, 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 I've got to crank up the pathos or, uh, you know, whatever. So I, I agree with you that, that the later chaplain is, is for me, it's a little, even though I think there's some excellent stuff in City Lights, um, there, there are also some, it gets a little self-conscious yeah. too. So, Sal, yeah. what, what do you think about uh, my idea about Chaplin and uh, the earlier Chaplin being funnier because the, the character of the tramp was crueler than he was in later films? Uh, well, to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with uh, with the evolution of, of Chaplin to 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 answer that. Okay. Uh, I mean, certainly there there is that uh, that slapstick uh, that's you know universal, so you you find it pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Well, let me. I, I think oh, it's probably. Go oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think there's probably more. There's probably more. Uh, the, there's early and maybe middle and later that you could that you could. Let me let me ask about the importance of uh, timing and uh, a sort of musicality uh, in comedy. And I'm thinking not slapstick so much where it's obvious, but in situational comedy. And I'm thinking specifically someone like a Bob Newhart. And if you listen to his telephone call uh, routines, um, Newhart, you don't know what the other person is supposedly saying. So you're, you're only getting 50% of the comedy routine. It's sort of like Abbott without Costello in a sense. Um, and yet some of them are hilarious. If you look online, you can watch the old uh, Newhart routines from the 50s and 60s when he first came up before he did his run of uh, great comedy shows. Um, so it, is there a sense of a rhythm, a musicality to comedy uh, that that becomes almost self-sustaining? Let me start with you, Ari. Well, yeah, I think you see it in different, I mean, in different ways. You mentioned... Uh... Bob Newhart and and not hearing the other side of the conversation. Um, I always think, I always wonder when I watch the Marx Brothers, uh, how different their timing was on stage because they were so used to, for most of their career, waiting for laughs or timing laughs. And then when you're filming in a studio on a set, you don't have anyone laughing, or maybe you have someone laughing at take one and take two, you don't have anyone laughing at take seven or eight. And um, I always, sometimes I wonder, I even hear lines, uh, you know, lines right up against each other. And I think, well, would they have done this on stage? Would this have been their, their, their choice? Um, but then of course you get people in, once you get people in, uh, in radio, when you have your recorded radio and television, then you hear people who are who are in front of an audience and working on timing. You know, you can hear them working on timing, like Jack Benny or Bob Newhart, or um, um, or in sitcoms, you can hear if they're from in front of a live audience. Sal. Well, um, at, you know, at the risk of, of being really, really boring, um, this is a subject where there is very, very little hard empirical research on timing. And um, um, what has been written largely is, is not any good uh, because it's all very impressionistic. Um, I did a study, I did a couple of studies with, uh, with some colleagues where we actually um, measured empirically with, with instruments um, you know, uh, things like uh, rhythm of speech and uh, pitch and uh, volume. And what we discovered is that regular speakers, not, not comedians, absolutely do not mark punchlines at all. Uh, mm -hmm. That is, it was the exact opposite of what we expected. Uh, everybody says, you know, everything, it's all about timing, you know, it's sort of like the, the stereotype, you should pause before the punchline. Well, native speakers just don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now comedians is a different story and nobody has done a study like, again, an empirical study because it's very difficult to get comedians to do what you want them to do. If you see what we did in the studies, we gave all the participants a joke and we said, tell this joke. If you tell a comedian, here's a joke, tell this joke, 
you're going to get, you know, 20 different, completely different things. Yeah. And it's not going to be any, any use to you because, you know, we're trying to measure, you know, the punchline and that, and that kind of thing. Um, so, so we haven't come up with, uh, with a, um, a protocol to be able to actually do a study like this with professional comedians because we suspect that it might be different. Um, you know, but it's, um, now, the other thing to, to say, and that's going back to what Ari was saying, um, when you're in front of an audience, and it's like, like a stand-up comedy, for example, right, where, where you have an audience that, that's reacting to what you do, then, then there is other dynamics that kick in, um, because then it's more like a, sort of the conversational thing. That is, if the, if the audience is laughing, you can't keep talking because they're not going to hear you. So you need to wait for the talk to die out. Then right. of course you can play with that. You know, you can sort of, uh, you know. So there is all sorts of, of things that, that have not been studied, to be, to be quite honest, um, because they're incredibly difficult to, to study. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, ask something about the difficulty of comedy versus drama. Now, Ari, I know you've done acting and i think from what i've looked on your on your website you've done a few dramatic roles is that correct mm -hmm. um yeah is th there's two points of view there's the the claim that comedy is so much harder than drama because you have to have that timing that rhythm that if you're doing o'neill you may not need to have on the other hand woody allen for example has always said that he thought uh uh, drama was sitting at the grown-ups table, whereas comedy was some, somehow below it. So do you, do? let me start with you, Art. Uh, do you uh, subscribe to the Woody Allen aspect? Oh, here comes Mitch again. Mitch, you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. My Wi-Fi is not the best. I'm going to have to go with just audio, I'm afraid. Okay, that's fine. Um, I was just, uh, let me, uh, let me just to finish what I'm doing here, and then I'll give you a chance to catch up. I was just asking Ari about uh, comedy and whether he thinks uh, comedy is harder, as some people claim, or like Woody Allen claims that doing drama is sitting at the grown-up table. So Ari, go, and then Sal, and then I'll get back to Mitch. Um, yeah, I, um, I I've never, I personally have never found one harder than the other. The the big thing, and it, it sounds like, sounds like a, a, I'm joking, but it's true that um, if you're doing a comedy, you know the um, the result immediately. If it's a joke and people laugh, then uh, something worked. Yeah. And if it's a drama, you may not know until you sp speak with someone later. Oh, I liked when you looked out the window and saw the cat. Yeah. You know, that yeah. was a, an important moment for me. Um, it's interesting, but uh, one thing I'll say is that um, I, I've, I've done a, I've done a couple of productions of uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, which I think is supposed to be i think it's listed as a comedy yeah. but it's so the comedy is so chilling yeah. that uh, yeah. when i when we did it in front of small audiences they were terrified of laughing because they didn't <laughs> would look around and they would say, oh i'm not gonna are you is that funny is that? if it was a bigger audience they felt they could there was room to hide and they could laugh a little well that may have also been perverted by alec baldwin's speech in the movie that doesn't appear in the play that is true alec baldwin <laughs> right so if they saw an alec baldwin speech yeah, that's a pretty terrifying. <laughs> uh, Sal, what's your comment on uh, on uh, the grown-ups table or not? Well, you know, my my uh, experience in acting is absolutely zero. I, I try to act uh, like a grown-up and fail at it. So, <laughs> um, uh, you know, all, all I can say that's that's uh, sort of semi uh, relevant to this is what you do find in um, in the literature is the idea that the comedy characters are flat and they tend to be more stereotypical, whereas uh, tragedy characters tend to be deeper and uh, to have more nuance. And that, you know, the idea for some authors at least, that's a feature of, of comedy is that you have to write the comedic character in, in a sort of cartoonish way because otherwise the comedy doesn't, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so so from that perspective, then I can understand Woody Allen uh, because, and I've never heard that particular quote, but um, you know, it would be consistent with this idea that uh, the the, com the comedic character is more of a cartoonish character, therefore it would be easier to act it, and instead doing Hamlet, 
would have to be like much, much harder because you have to have, you know, uh, fields. Yeah. Uh, Mitch, uh, is, are you still there, Mitch? Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, well, well, well I, I was going to say you're sort of the gummo marks of our group here, but uh, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> Mitch, if you do you have any comment on uh, the idea of uh, whether drama or comedy is harder or not? I do have to agree with Woody Allen on this one, but I feel like the comic relief components of most every drama plays off that contrast. So in, in a sense, you've got things that are consistent with some of the models of humor in that a long duration of a serious set of interactions does set up an expectation that the folks can violate and, and create humor in unexpected places those ways. So to, yeah, to have Gummo Marx be the, the straight guy to, to set up uh, everything for the comedy to happen is, is a delightful way to pepper dramas with comedy. And of course, Woody Allen knows that. Um, you mentioned uh, the unexpected, and I was gonna touch on that. Is, do you think that humor, is is dependent on upon a sort of dissonance from the expected, Mitch? Well, uh, with Dr. Tardo in the room, I'm embarrassed to even start discussing it. But that uh, violation of an expectation is quite the impressive model of how humor works. Yeah. Sal, how about yes. you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Ari, would you make it a trio? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, definitely. I think it's a, but it, it, there's also the element of enjoying, I, I've never quite underst understood why we enjoy jokes a second time. Mm. Uh, there's a, a couple of times we can enjoy jokes. Music, songs we can enjoy maybe 10, 50,000 times. There, but jokes we can even, even when we expect, even when we know what's coming, we can still enjoy it a second or a third time, uh, maybe not a fifth or a sixth time. And that's all, that's all I would add. Well, that, that's, well an, that's an interesting point. Go ahead, Sal. Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's jokes that uh, that uh, get better uh, with time. You know, it's like uh, each time that I say no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, it gets better. You know, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, don't get my wife started on the first one, call me Shirley. Uh, yeah. You know, that's uh, um, you know, because because actually repetition, um, mm -hmm. it turns out, you know, within the single joke, it's not that important. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking at larger uh, things like novels, short stories, it becomes very important. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, you know, long conversations and what have you, and, you know, lifetime uh, conversations, then repetition has a pleasure in and of itself. Mm -hmm. so, so when you hear the same joke, um, you know, and you know what's coming, but mm -hmm. it is because you know what's coming that you enjoy it because... Yeah. You know, in part you're remembering the, the first time, and in part it's just because each time it's slightly different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it becomes a running joke in and of itself is to tell the joke. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the, the, you know, Shirley and don't call me Shirley. Yeah. Um, so, so my wife loves this joke and uh, she's, she's British and we go to a conference in Spain and somebody says, surely something. Right? Yeah. And she says, first of all, don't call me Shirley. And 100 Spaniards look at her in complete astonishment. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, she and I then after laughed hysterically about this yeah. because it, it was sort of the funniest thing in the universe for us. The, the, the audience of the conference, not so much, you know. Incidentally, the DVD of, of Airplane. Uh, on the cover, it says the "Don't Call Me Shirley" edition. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. It, it, it reminds me when you said that. Oh, go ahead, Mitch. Well. Go ahead. My Mitch. wife's a big fan of that joke as well. Actually, the stand-up Doug Stanhope uh, plays off this and es essentially will start repeating uh, punchlines in the way that uh, a song might repeat a refrain to show the contrast between the two, and it, it ends up being funny in this sort of parody of how easy it is to write a rock song, for example. Yeah. So I feel like uh, uh, the, the meta comment on that fact does play its uh, own role in some of the more uh, outrageous stand-up humor. It would seem to me that a lot of vaudevillian 
humor was uh, sort of based on that. I think of like some of the famous Abbott and Costello sketches, who's on first, uh, there was the blue and the, the family friendly version. And then I always crack up at the Susquehanna Hat Company one where, where Lou gets the crap beat out of him by a handful of people, you know, and you always know they're going to break the hat, break it over his head. And, you know, you owe Tony five more bucks, Lou, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I guess there is a sense of the, that growing familiarity. But I would think that maybe it's sort of like having sex with the same beautiful woman a third or fourth time and that you're never going to have that first excitement, but she's still beautiful anyway. <laughs> that's, that's a good analogy. Um, uh, let me talk about, uh, and oh, before I move on, let me just uh, ask Mitch something. Uh, uh, we, When you had dropped off there, I had uh, asked the other fellows uh, their comments about the idea of cruelty and humor. Before I move on, I just want to ask Mitch if you have any comments on that. It's funny because slapstick has uh, such a history, as I'm sure these guys have, have emphasized, but I think what often makes it funny is that realization that it actually hasn't done an incredible amount of harm. Mm -hmm. uh, this benign violation model that's getting so trendy in the last couple of years seems to rely on that. So for someone to slip on a banana peel and look up and you can sort of tell that they're not hurt uh, seems to have some of the draw of creating humor that way. So it's socially acceptable to go, go ahead and laugh. Um, I think the joke that's used uh, as a stimulus in a lot of those experiments uh, relies on uh, basically a, a famous rock star snorting up his father's ashes thinking they're cocaine, which sounds completely gross to me, but, but if it's worded correctly and you realize it's, it's not really doing any harm, then suddenly that's funny, but it's not until there's something benign about it that the violation of that uh, taboo is actually considered funny. And Mitch, I'd also ask them about their ideas about rhythm and, and, and sort of musicality in humor, uh, especially in something like a Bob Newhart phone sketch. Uh, do you have any comment uh, on uh, sort of the, the rhythm, the rhythms of comedy? Well, what's wild is when you have some of those models that require um, an expectation and a violation, and then you realize that uh, you've misinterpreted something, but you've misinterpreted it in a way that's not going to hurt you the cognitive click that has to happen, the sort of recognition that, oh, they meant a guy named who, not who's on first, yeah. that takes a certain amount, it may be milliseconds, but a certain amount of time so that if the presentation has the appropriate pauses, it really works. And man, if you saw Rain Man, you see if it doesn't have those pauses, it, it just doesn't work. And I, I think that's a, a delightful comment on the way cognition works in humans. Yeah. Um, let me move on, because uh, I wanted to talk about the way that uh, cultures or different people approach and get the same type of humor. And what I mean by that is, uh, I don't know, are, are the, any of the three of you familiar with the old Alfred Hitchcock film, The Lady Vanishes? Indeed. I saw yeah. it once a while yeah. back. Well, in, in that there are two guys, you know, it's about a spy woman, an old woman who vanishes on a train. And there are these two characters called Charters and Caldecott, who apparently became very big in Britain as a comedy team. They had a, several of their own uh, comedy films after that. And the interesting thing was I, I watched a little uh, like DVD uh, featurette on them uh, from The Lady Vanishes. And it said that they, they their humor was based on called uh, sort of a how and why humor, or what and who humor, uh, meaning that they would, one would say, did you know that Mr. Brown went to the, went to the toity or something? He said, how do you do that? And, and, and you get these questions, how, what, why, where, yeah. bouncing back and forth like a ping pong ball. And that's the basis of their humor. And I know that the, the reason that stood out to me was when I've written novels or, or short stories and, that are in humorous vein, I'd also come across that, but I'd never seen The Lady Vanishes. And so I wonder if uh, it's sort of like, I guess, are, is there one path or are there many paths to the nirvana of humor uh, and that that uh, different comedians or different uh, comics uh, will get to that same point? Let's say if you want to do socially conscious humor, is there is there a preferred method or can you go multiple routes and get to that same uh, do it in the same way, sort of unconsciously, I guess. Um, Ari, if you want to go, do you know what I'm trying uh, to get to? Well, uh, as far as the how and why, the, I think um, 
Burn, George Burns and Gracie Allen, yeah. they did a lot of that. So, you know, oh, my brother, my brother just got a, my, my brother just crossed the Atlantic in two days. Crossed the Atlantic in two days. How did he do that? You know, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, so there's that, that's, a, that's another example that's uh, probably uh, slightly more accessible, easier to find online. Yeah. Um, um, and I know the two characters you're talking about, The Lady Vanishes, has just been such a long time to, since I saw it. As far as social commentary, I don't think there's a, a single way to do it. There's, um, um, I mean, if you listen to, uh, there's a comedian named Anthony Jesselnik, who does a lot of, I think he's very funny. He does a lot of social commentary, but it's, it's, um, he kind of, he sort of tells you he's doing social commentary and he tests the audience by what kind of horrible, disgusting joke that they might laugh at. So he says, oh, it's okay. You're going to laugh at this. All right. So I'm all right. Or he'll make a very, um, I mean, he'll, he, he made a joke about, uh, who was the singer uh, whose whose child fell from the balcony? Um, oh, Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton. I mean, he made a joke about Eric Clapton's child, and uh, you know, just to see where he stood with the audience. Mm. Um, so I, uh, that's that's one way, uh, the Jesselneck way. I'm not brave enough to do the Jesselneck way, <laughs> or the Sarah Silverman. She also has a lot of a lot of guts. I don't have her guts. Uh, Mitch, uh, do you have a comment on that? Actually, Greg Dean, who's a, a comedy coach and has a book out in Los Angeles and actually trained Anthony Jesselneck, would call this a format joke. So that there's a certain strategy where you use this same series of questions or a sort of uh, format as far as the way things are worded that actually relies on that setting up the expectation and then violating it later. So you'll hear Anthony do these really bitter series of three horrible punchlines and then something almost warm and you're you're kind of stunned and surprised because you, he set himself up as this uh bitter horrendous antisocial <laughs> and so when when he does then violate that you get a joke on both sides so uh mm -hmm. yeah greg dean really hammered that home in, in some of his work and i love that it's uh become such a, a common uh practice among standards sal what is your comment on that well, generally speaking, uh, Greg's, uh, Greg Dean's work uh, is very, very good. He's, he's probably one of the best uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, he's a comedian, but he has an understanding of theory, and that doesn't happen very often. So, so he's really um, somebody that I've recommended um, in the past uh, you know, for, for people who are interested in that. I mean, generally speaking, you can do pretty much anything with you because um, it's a relational uh, mechanism, right? So, so you can set up your, your expectations anyway, in any situation. Uh, I mean, there's a few situations where humor is, is socially inappropriate, you know, and so then you can't, you can't joke there at all. And even then, sometimes that, that gets violated. But so once you've got your, your expectation, then you can violate it pretty much in any way. So, so you can really do almost anything and be, uh, you know, you can get at it from pretty much any uh, perspective. Um, there's there's no preferred way to uh, to urinate. There are only uh, things that are socially acceptable and that are socially popular at that particular time. Uh, so, for example, embarrassment humor, which is huge now, especially among young people, I understand. Um, you know, that, I don't understand it. It doesn't uh, doesn't work for me. I look at it and I say, is that supposed to be funny? Uh, but my daughter thinks it's hilarious, and uh, you know, it's a huge uh, it's a huge thing. Um, but and it probably mm, happened in the past twenty years, I, I would guess. So you get these changes in in um, you know what's popular, in, but the the fundamental mechanisms are always the same. And as I said, they, they, you know, you can get at it from any direction. Really. Um, we talked, uh, well, it was, it was mentioned, I think, by Mitch about violations. And I wanted to bring up the idea of what used to be called blue humor. Um, yeah. uh, now using, you know, the F word or fuck, we're not bound by the FCC, so we can say it. Um, and a lot of comedians around 1950s and 60s, uh, you know, there was a, a big debate with, uh, what's his name, Lenny, um, 
Lenny uh, Bruce, Bruce. Lenny Bruce and, and then Richard Pryor and George Carlin came along. Um, people like Bill Cosby, not that I, <laughs> he's sort of verboten now, but he, he, he would never use, uh, he saved all his, his blueness for his private life, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, he, you know, he, he, he frowned upon that. Uh, is violation, do you, so, uh, this is sort of getting back to what we talked about, Woody Allen and the Grown Ups Table versus drama. Um, some people think that it's a lazy way to get a, a joke. Other people say, make them laugh however you do it, the hell with it. Um, Ari, what is your take on that? I know, I remember you were not someone who was big on curse words and whatnot. Yeah, I don't, um, I, I think part of it is just my, my general meekness in, in life. Uh, so I, um, but I think, I don't know, when, when, I, when I hear people in conversation or, or comedians in both, in, in both situations, I think if there's, if there's too much of it, um, I think, well, this person doesn't have as much to say as he or she thinks. Uh -huh. um, uh, so when I overhear conversations, people talking on the phone, and, you know, it's the, the F words all over the place, I, I always think, you know, this, this conversation actually should be about 10 minutes shorter. You really don't have enough to say. Um, I think if it's done, I, I don't mind... I don't mind swearing if it, uh, and, and you know, I, it doesn't have to be if, if it is proper. I think um, if it, uh, some people swear very well, some people are very good at good at it. Um, but I think if it's oh, if it's all the time, then, then it loses its effectiveness. It's like um, uh, with, uh, John Cleese at uh, Graham Chapman's uh, funeral. Uh, he said. Um, well, I just wanted to be the first person to say fuck at a funeral. <laughs> and uh, so that, you know, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's, uh, funny. that's funny with an O. Uh, but uh, I think if it's, if, it's, if it's all the time, you know, it's... Yeah. it's Mitch, what is your I take on that? It's funny because I think we all grew up hearing that uh, people who use the F word a lot simply didn't have a very large vocabulary or were somehow not verbally fluent. Uh, there's a researcher at Marist College who suggested that that's really not the case. So now the threshold has changed over the years. Um, they've shown that basically if you can generate a whole lot of swear words, you can also generate a whole lot of, of other words. Um, but back in the 80s, I used to teach about adrenaline and uh, the sympathetic nervous system and say it's the three Fs, fleeing, fighting, and mating. And that <laughs> get a huge laugh. Doing that now, I would just get guffaws and eye rolls. So it's funny how now, essentially, uh, to say fought almost anywhere is, is not what it once meant. Back in the day, they used to have these tachistoscopic presentations where they'd show you a word just for a few milliseconds, and you had to guess what it was. And it always took much longer to identify fuck than it did a comparable four-letter word that was not uh, a swear word. And those effects have also dissipated over the last 30 years to the point now where you can't even replicate that in the lab anymore. Sal, what is your comment on that? Well, um, I'm assuming you're all familiar with the aristocrats joke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to deliver it now, but, uh, you know, um, I, I, I have to agree. I mean, the, the profanity and obscenity as a, as a way of getting a, a violation is basically over in terms of, of uh, shock factor, um, you know, because just the society has moved on. Uh, now you need to do something way more um, challenging to get um, uh, to get uh, people's um, hides up. Uh, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen, for example, yeah. uh, is doing stuff that's uh, very, very, very uh, cutting edge because he mixes reality with uh, with the comedy in ways that makes people very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, okay. I did one more thing. I was watching an episode of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And Sue Ann Nivens, who is the sweet, uh, yeah. sweet, happy homemaker, she talks about how how her wonderful meal, if it cook, if it's if it's not served immediately, you just have to flush it down the toilet. And I remember watching it when I was on it, and and not even saying flush it down the toilet was just so funny, you know, that that this person was saying it. And now you watch it again and say, what? Why is it, Why is the audience laughing? 
It's yeah. not that fun. Yeah, I, I, I want to return to that point in a moment about the, the, the datedness of humor and how it goes out of date. But I wanted to uh, give two examples of people <clears throat> who are sort of noted for blue humor and why I think, well, and see whether you agree with me, I think one person was great up until the end and the other person wasn't. I'm talking about Howard Stern and George Carlin. When I was a young man and listening to Howard Stern in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was living in New York, I found his humor very good. And I, I still think he has moments of absolute brilliance, but the constant potty humor, the constant tits and the constant lesbian jokes and the this and the that, it gets lost in sort of a sea. Whereas with George Carlin, when I've seen the clips of him up until his death, whatever it was, 10, 12 years ago, it might have been. Um, and he's talking about uh, politics and and uh, the Republicans and the Democrats and this and that. And he's doing his, I mean, he, he he's, he's gleefully vicious, but yet Carlin doesn't seem to me to be dated. I don't know if you guys agree with me, but they seem to have a different approach. One, Stern seems to be the boy who never grew up, whereas Carlin seems to be the guy who grew up and just doesn't give a damn. Um, what is your take, Ari, on those two approaches? And do you agree with me uh, on my assessments? Yeah, I, I never was very fond of Howard Stern. I mean, I know a lot of people are, uh, but I just, because of that, I thought it was just, all right, you're, you're putting all of this stuff in all of the time. And I just, I think I got bored kind of quickly. Um, with Carlin, it's interesting because he, I think if you listen to his records, he has this, um, those are from the 70s. Actually, he had another period where he was sort of a more traditional stand-up comedian. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, he, he was, he would do, in the 70s, it was about analyzing language and about, uh, and he was doing social commentary. And then later on, he got into this, he's, as again, you were saying, I think, I think you said something like, an old guy who just doesn't care and his yeah. voice got rough. Yeah. Too, and he's sort of, he was sort of like this, when he was before, it was like this. Yeah. And, um, but he still had, I mean, he still was so sharp and he was still making his, his, his commentary was still uh, incisive. So I, I think he was, I, I think he, he moved along and just had a slightly, just a, a different, uh, a different, a slightly different point of view uh, or slightly different approach is what I'm, what I'm getting at. But I, I don't think he ever lost it. Mitch, do you have a comment on a Stern versus Carlin approaches? I'm afraid I was also never a big fan of, of Stern, but the, the key concept psychologically is known as habituation, where if you have the same stimulus repeatedly, your initial response to it may be pretty dramatic, but after re repetition, you just don't, don't have the same thing. I, I feel like in some ways, uh, people treat some folks who do that almost as a parody of themselves, whereas Carlin really was, I share your, your enthusiasm for good at reinventing himself with with a novel identity so if you hear about the iffy dippy weather man that's clearly different from the the way he was at the end say deconstructing the ten commandments so that there's not only a novel content but a, a novel approach and then in in some ways the the swearing or or uh the taboo topic is is almost irrelevant how about you, Sal? What is your take uh, on either Stern or Carlin? Well, I mean, besides the sort of feeling I have always had that Carlin was was a very sophisticated uh, comedian, and Howard Stern definitely not. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, not, I don't have anything to add beyond that. Okay. Well, let me get back to the idea of the datedness of humor. Um, uh, are you the the idea of a now 45 or close to 50 year old uh, sitcom joke that doesn't ring true. Um, you know, and I'm sure if we, well, I've often thought, for example, Shakespeare, I can't believe people would laugh at his comedies. To me, his comedies are just terrible. Um, yeah. But uh, it's like, it's like, you know, well, you know, well, hell, young, young man, uh, isn't that something? But there must have been something back 400 years ago that had people rollicking. Or, uh, yeah. uh, um, so what do you think it is? Does comedy have an expiration date? Let's say, um, let me start with Sal this time. Sal, what, what is your take? Well, I mean, generally speaking, no, because, because as, as I was saying before, most of comedy is, is really universal. So, you know, even Shakespeare, you know, it's, it's hard to, to work with it because some of the references are dated. You're not understanding 
what he's talking about. But you know, when you get Falstaff being beaten uh, by women in a uh, basket of dirty laundry, that's your basic uh, slapstick comedy that works uh, all the time. Um, are you familiar with the Philogelos? It's a, it's a collection of uh, jokes from the fourth century AD. Uh, I, I'm sorry. What was that? The, the what? It, it's called Philogelos. It's a it's a collection no. of uh, jokes from the fourth century no. AD Greek. Okay. Um, some of the jokes work today. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, there's like a guy walks up to a funeral and says, "Who's the dead guy?" Yeah. And he said, "The one in the co in the coffin." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this joke is 1700 years old. Yeah. Works beautifully, right? Yeah. So, so, so there isn't a built in expiration date in you, but the world changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, going back to the Mary Tyler Moore, um, you have a lot of jokes about drunkenness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a whole shtick that, that they have about Rob being drunk and falling over, etc. You don't see these jokes today because today drunkenness is a disease and it's pathetic. It's yeah. not funny. Yeah. Well, yeah. Who, who, so, is, who is the, who is the stand-up comedy who was on those Dean Martin roasts who was always drunk? What was his name? Oh, um, Foster Brooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he not have a career today, I guess. Right. He would, uh, but I find him. I find it very funny. Yeah. I, uh, sorry. Yeah. But but socially, you can't sell it anymore yeah. because because socially now. Alcoholism is a disease, mm -hmm. and it's not fun, mm -hmm. right? And right. so you can't, you know. And so, so what's changed is the society, not the humor. Mm -hmm. You know, the humor is, is right there, but we no longer react it because we see it from a different lens. And the lens is that uh, you know it's no longer acceptable uh, for humor; it's no longer available uh, for for humor. Mitch, what's your comment on the datedness of uh, humor? It's intriguing because if you see jokes as sort of having a reference and a punchline, um, as Dr. Tardo has alluded to, if, if the reference is no longer good, it just doesn't work. So I was watching some folks read through a play and it had a joke about DDT. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, people today don't even know what DDT is. Yeah. So they said, well, what if we made it about dioxin? Mm -hmm. Even dioxin is already dated now. So it's like we have to find yet another thing that sort of fits that same format that folks will get as a reference in order for this punchline to work so that the, the structure uh, of the joke would be very much the same, but we have to have a reference that, that people are going to recognize. So I'm afraid when, you know, when I allude to who's on first, there's a whole generation of folks who don't even get that anymore. Yeah. I'll uh, emphasize things from, you know, classic movies from when I was growing up with undergrads and there's just absolutely no clue <laughs> Um, so they don't know who Spicoli is, for example. Yeah. So I can't really do that riff. <laughs> uh, Ari, what's your take on Daedonus? Well, when you mentioned Shakespeare, I, of course, thought of my experience reading Shakespeare and then reading the footnotes to the jokes explaining why they were funny. <laughs> uh, one of the more frustrating experiences of my life. Uh, uh, I, find, I find reading Shakespeare just so frustrating because I, I consider myself pretty well educated uh, English speaker and every time I read Shakespeare I have to think okay what does he mean what is this because just because the language changes forget about the jokes but then reading reading the footnote about why the joke was funny and then going back and trying to laugh at the joke retroactively that's 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 challenging well uh, it should be say, stated for the, the other two fellows who don't know you had a, a partner, Ben Bach, and you did a comedy team called Clitic and Calc. Yes, yes, we did. Yes, we would do. We would answer questions about uh, burning questions that people would send in about the etymologies of words. So we would say, <laughs> yeah. "Oh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Jones of uh, Dubuque, Iowa. She and her husband have a uh, dispute about the origin of the word, uh, you know, genuflect. Can you help us?" And then we would explain the. Uh, and so it was, it was a good, it was a nice, uh, it was a nice comedy shtick that we did. Um, uh, and that's incidentally what I was referring to at the beginning of my, the comedy was a little different. So it's more theatrical. It's kind of stand up and theater kind of put together. It cuts down on the heckling factor mm -hmm. like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask something too. Um, 
about humor because we we talked about dadeness and 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 things uh, like not talking about drunkenness. But Ari, since you're Jewish, can you get away with telling a joke about Jews that Sal, who I'm assuming Sal, you're not Jewish, couldn't? Um, I don't know if we could. I mean, I think uh, I think some people might look look askance. I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, it's uh, I've done. I mean, I I did a show where I came out dressed as Hitler. Uh, that was the opening number. The opening number was, uh, and I think a couple of people left uh, in disgust, which I can understand. So a law is a rabbi, and he can get away with it. But if you're really in the in group, then you can. Yeah. Other is no. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. I, I don't know. I I uh, I forgot the name of the English guy who does the uh, who did a did bits about the SS officers uh, talking about. Yeah, what is this SS all about? And uh, you know, hey, we have skulls on our ca on a, we have we have skulls on our on our, uh, our collars. We might really be the bad guys. You know, mm -hmm. we might be. Uh, so I don't know. I think I think it it depends. Uh, I I I have a slight Hitler obsession, as you might remember. <laughs> so I'm I'm all about the Hitler humor. Other mm -hmm. things might not flow as mm -hmm. well. Mitch, uh, what is your take on? Uh sort of in-joke humor within a group? I think the only way you can get away with it is if you can actually make it clear that you're in the in-group, and then, of course, you're permitted. So uh, folks... Well, that, that would be like in the Woody Allen film, dressing up as a rabbi, you know? Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, the fact that my father-in-law is a rabbi, he can say anything that, I mean, I wouldn't even dare going uh, anywhere near as far as uh, stuff that would be uh, interpreted as, as anti-Semitic. Um, un unfortunately, folks who are, you know, just uh, average, <laughs> average white males, it's, it's, it's a lot tougher. But when you're, when you're in the out group, you're allowed to make fun of the out group. Mm -hmm. Sal, what is your take on uh, uh, sort of racial, sexual kind of humor being in the in group, et cetera? Well, I mean, you know, it's it's absolutely true. If if you if you are in the in group, you can say anything you want about the in group. If you're in the out group, you can say anything you want, but then it gets very very aggressive. Uh, I mean, you know, we we don't like to talk about this, but there is humor out there uh, which is astonishingly aggressive and ugly. I mean, ugly in ways, uh, you know, like disturbing uh, you know and i'm talking about like racist and uh, and uh, you know the kind of humor that you're going to find on 4chan on the internet you know that kind of uh, that kind of thing um so so you can do it but you know it becomes extremely uh, aggressive you know so so it's not that you cannot do it but you position yourself um it, with a stance that's very very aggressive you know? And so, you know, it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, the, the aggression part of humor. Mm. It depends on the kind of humor. Yeah. Well, I talked about datedness. I wanted to bring up a point that was made to reference back to Woody Allen. I talked about him and sitting at the grown-ups table. And in his film Crimes and Misdemeanors, the Alan Alda character in there has a famous uh, line where he says that... Uh, Comedy is tragedy plus time. He, he goes on and says, you know, when when uh, Lincoln was shot, you couldn't make a joke the, the next day about him being shot. But now time has passed. And it goes on with Woody saying, you know, you answered one question. It took 45 minutes, you know. And, 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 uh, but I'm wondering, is that was that just a joke within the film? Or is there something to that? And how does that relate to the datedness uh, idea? Ari, do you have a, an idea? Oh, sure. I think generally in history, it's, it's uh, I mean, if you hear about five people who were killed yesterday, that's terrible. But if you hear about, you know, 10,000 people who were killed at the Battle of, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, Marathon yeah. in whatever year that was, I used to know, I think. Anyway, that doesn't, it doesn't bother us. We don't, we would say, oh, that's a lot of people, those poor, you know, those poor folks. Yeah. But if something happened yesterday, that's, you know, it's absolutely awful. Yeah. So, um, Oh yeah, time, time, and 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 you can make jokes about the uh, well. Johnny Carson found out the uh, the hard way. He was he made a joke about uh, Lincoln, the Lincoln assassination, and he booed. And of course, he waited. His timing was great, and he said, "100 years later, he still can't make Abraham Lincoln jokes." 
<laughs> Mitch, what is your take on uh, that uh, concept? So I have a vague memory of the day after the Challenger explosion, uh, a, a classmate trying to make a joke about it, and it really was not going to fly. Huh. And now I'm not even sure the reference. <laughs> I'm not even sure if the reference would 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 uh, catch enough people. So there's uh, something about the violation being benign enough, and if it if it is too soon, then the violation is no longer benign. So. Uh, Right after 9-11, of course, nobody could say anything about it, yeah. but literally within a year, there were there were some jokes in the, in the underground about it that, that seemed to get some laughs. Uh, Sal, what is your take on that? Well, I mean, it, it's nothing new. Already Bergson had said that humor was incompatible with emotion. You know, if, <laughs> if you feel, if you have strong emotion about something, you can't, you can't joke about it. Mm. Um, that, that, that's an interesting take. Um, but on the other hand, it, it, isn't humor itself an emotion and, or an emotional response? Well, uh, I mean, mirth would be the emotional response to, to, to humor. Okay. Uh, but uh, sorry, the academic in me, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't resist. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's it's an emotion of, of amusement, of, of uh, sort of you know merriment, that that kind of that kind of thing. Um, which is why it's incompatible, for example, with pain or with, uh, uh, you know, compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody slips on the banana peel and you say, oh, my God, they broke their, their leg and, uh, you know, they're going to be uh, homeless because they will lose their job, you can't laugh at it mm -hmm. because, because now it's a pathetic subject. And whereas in order to laugh at it, you have to say, you know, it doesn't matter. It's nothing serious. It's okay. We can laugh at it, so it has to be available for 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 humor because it doesn't uh, it doesn't touch the other. Yeah, um, as we're recording here in early August 2018, uh, for anyone watching this, uh, eons hence, uh, <laughs> um, there's there was a fellow uh, a Hollywood director named James Gunn who recently got into trouble for making pedophilia jokes on Twitter, uh, but they were made like ten or twelve years ago and then dug up, and so even in just a decade or so, the tenor of the times has changed. And uh, I'm wondering if it's fair to judge humor. I mean, is it fair to look at, for example, picking any humor from the 1880s now and say, oh, those terrible rotten people? Um, uh, how about you, Sal? What's your take on that? Well, I mean, you know, fair is always uh, uh, difficult to, to, to say. I mean, certainly at the time, um, you know, that kind of humor was perfectly acceptable because, well, I mean, you know, racism was perfectly acceptable at the time. Yeah. So, you know, within that context, uh, you know, the little jockey uh, uh, outside the house was, was perfectly normal. Today, uh, you know, it's a, it's a huge problem. So, you know. Does that mean that those people were rotten? Does it mean that Shakespeare was an anti-Semite because of Shylock? Huh. Um, you know, this, the category of anti-Semite doesn't exist in Shakespeare's time. So, hmm. so it's difficult to make the case. It's anachronistic, to say the least. Yeah. How about you, Mitch? What's your take on that? I have to admit, James Gunn took a fiction writing class with my dad about 15 years ago, so I'm always on his side no matter what. <laughs> I can't pretend like I'm unbiased. But the, the clincher is, as, as Dr. Tardo emphasizes, there are uh, standards that definitely change, and I'm glad to see that society is, is making progress. But the fact that uh, we can't really judge folks by the standards of modern times when we're, when we're looking back at what uh, was considered okay. Um, the re-release of the Disney film Song of the South, yeah. uh, the whole movie, for example, I don't think we're going to ever see that really, really happen because there's so much of the racist content that is just embarrassing now. And I, I think it's nice that we have these in order to talk about the, the topics, but to really uh, blame folks for, you know, being racist in a time when racism was not a construct is a little unfair. But Mitch, let me just ask you though, before I go on to Ari, um, isn't that sort of like uh, if you're t taking shots at Song of the South, and while I don't think it's uh, a work of art uh, as high as Huckleberry Finn, there are always going to be these cretins 
that will look at a Huckleberry Finn and it has the word nigger in it. And I don't think the Song of the South did. Maybe it did. I it, it's been one, I saw that when I was five or six. But it, isn't that a slippery slope? It's sad, but I mean, Huck Finn is a, is a fine example, actually. I, I feel like there's a, a chance to entertain discussions of bias without having to be judgmental about it. So, I mean, for, for four white guys to use the word nigger is really upsetting. There was a time when we could have gotten away with that. Can we talk about these changes across eras in a way that can decrease, you know, uh, conflict across groups, yes, to to claim that it's that it's uh, expecting some prescience on on people, you know, decades before, it, it's just it's just unfair. I think there'll be a time when, you know, we may look back and say, oh, my God, people back in the 21st century ate meat or they had lawns, you know, things like that, stuff that we think is completely, yeah. absolutely fine and, and, and standards are going to change. Yeah. Well, people will look at blow up dolls and they'll say, well, now we have I have freedom, my sex bot in 100 years. And, you know, I'm married to a, an artificial and intelligent robot or something. But uh, Ari, what is your take on uh, uh, the James Gunn kind of uh, pulling things from the past? Yeah, I well, there's a whole lot of uh, it seems looking for things like that, you know, digging into 10 year old uh, posts and so forth. I guess what for me, what's what's most disturbing is that you the 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 um let's say the year of respectability that is after this year it, things become respectable it keeps getting moved closer yeah. and closer to the speaker so that what you were saying i can't believe people in the 21st century still had lawns or whatever um it, it's it's um you know uh Someone 10 years ago might have said, oh, yes, these people before 1980, they really didn't, they had no sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Then, oh, these people before 1990, they had no sensitivity before 2000. And so you, you create these, you know, almost everyone who lived before me was wrong and uneducated mm -hmm. and stupid. Um, I saw, incidentally, a, a, just by chance, a, a clip from the Smothers Brothers. Now, the Smothers Brothers... Uh, they were thrown off of TV for being too uh, political and too yeah. left wing. And I saw a sketch that they could never do today, not because it was too left wing, but because it was culturally insensitive. And I thought, oh my gosh, people who would see that, who saw this, they might only see, oh, the Smothers Brothers. Who were they? They were the people who did this culturally insensitive thing. Was that the one where they're playing and they're, they're singing like Negro spirituals? There was a... No, uh, this was with uh, Patty Duke, uh, and they were doing Native America. It was a Native American oh, okay. sketch. It was, yeah. Um, do you think then, and I'll go from Ari over to Sal, do you think that humor then is in danger by political correctness, or do you, do you think this forces comedians to be better? Um, I think there is some danger in, from political correctness. I'm, I'm always trying to fight against it. I mean, it's not... I mean, if it, as soon as someone says, you're not allowed to say this or this, well, someone is going to jump on that right. bandwagon and start saying that, this and this. Um, I mean, uh, there's always this, this uh, as Sarah Silverman, again, I mentioned her before, she has a whole wonderful joke about cultural sensitivity. And um, I don't know if I have time to, to tell it. Yeah, but go ahead. She, it it's about, okay, so she's, she's I'll, I'll compress it. She said, I'm doing my act and I have this joke about um, African, about, about black people. And I look down in the front row and there's this African-American couple and the joke is coming up and I don't know what to do. And I think, should I be culturally sensitive or should I stick to my guns and tell the joke as it was intended? And I thought about it and, you know, when it came time, I decided to be culturally and uh, culturally sensitive, and so I changed the punchline to chinks. <laughs> <laughs> now that is, <laughs> leave it at that. Okay. Uh, how about you, Mitch? That is, is political correctness a threat to humor, or does it make for better comedians in the future? I, I think uh, in the stand-up community, it, it actually is helping folks refine things where it's dampening. Uh, is folks outside of those obvious humor settings. So I don't know 
how these guys feel. But uh, there was a time when I was a, a guaranteed award-winning teacher. And now things I used to say clearly cannot come out of my mouth anymore at the front of the classroom. And the, the opportunity to be funny in settings that aren't set up as stereotypically places for humor has really tightened up to the point where uh, I at least am, am pretty apprehensive about joking around. And I have friends who've literally lost jobs because of uh, things that they thought were casual jokes. So uh, right now it's, it's, it's a tough time. Sal, do you see political correctness as a threat or an opportunity for comedians? Well, you know, I, I agree with, uh, with what Mitch was saying. That is, if, if you are within the clearly defined comedy uh, situation, it really makes absolutely no difference. It, it, you know, the Sarah Silverman example is, is a perfectly good one. You can make fun of it. Um, what it what it does though is in those situations that are not clearly defined as as playful environment where you can say stuff, um, then you have to start censoring yourself. And I, I do so myself. I I don't say things that uh, um, could offend uh, whatever. So so you just make sure that and then you know it's sort of uh, it makes the whole. Uh, experience uh, slightly less entertaining for 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 everybody, um, but I mean, there's there's nothing you can do. It's the society that's changing. It's not. Um, well, I want to touch upon one more topic, and then uh, I'll just go and give you all a final say. So, um, uh, and that is, we've talked about different types of comedy: situational comedy, slapstick, cruelty and humor, uh, blue humor, etc. And I wanted to talk about one other type. I mentioned Abner Costello, and I also think of Groucho Mark. When I think of the sort of sort of verbal, uh, uh, verbal high flying humor. Um, if you watch the old Marx Brothers movies, and I, I'm a Marx Brothers fan, but I got to be honest, 95 percent of the Marx Brothers humor is Groucho. I mean, Groucho. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, he 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 just dominates that. And with Abner Costello. I mean, they were, to me, the sine qua non of that vaudevillian humor. They just perfected it there with their wordplay uh, in some of the sketches I mentioned and, and a dozen or so others. Um, uh, let me ask you, Ari, since uh, you uh, have done uh, word or verbal humor too, um, what is your take on that kind of humor? Is that a different breed of comic? The, and I could throw in Woody Allen too. Is a Woody Allen, is a Abner and Costello, a Groucho Marx, are they different then say the political humor uh, of a Carlin, the the sort of rhythmic humor of a Newhart. Yeah, I think so. I think because they're they're, I, I think what you, I think it, putting um, uh, putting wit and rhythm together because so much of it is about the rhythm. So much of, the, of what Groucho says uh, is you know, um, you know you, you, you sometimes you read quotations by him. Where he says, "Yes, I decided to take this word out because it spoiled the joke." Uh, um, so, um, whereas I think you know George Carlin, he can take his time, he can listen to the audience. Uh, I mean, he still does verbal humor, um, but uh, I think with Groucho, it was more you wanted more rapid fire type of things. Um, Woody Allen, I uh, Woody Allen is a different kind of, of rhythm because his is about delays and about. Uh, uh, stuttering, the stuttering yeah. is part circumlocution. of the circumlocution. You know, because yeah. <clears throat> it's <clears throat> like a totally type of situation here. Um, um, yeah, I was just thought of the joke with uh, where you're saying, uh, uh, This is Mrs. Uh, Mandelbaum, and she says, It's Pransky. So Mandelbaum, Pransky, what's the difference? You, you take off the same holidays. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I, if I, if I made the point, but yeah. if I made a point, but, um, yeah, it's a different thing because it's so, it's so dependent on your style of delivery. And it's interesting because not only in the films, but if you watch, if you go online, you can find some great outtakes from You Bet Your Life where Groucho is off camera and you see yeah. him, or they were cut from the show because they would tape an hour and then cut it down to a half hour. Right. He's, just, he's just brilliant. But anyway, Mitch, what is your take on people like uh, Marx, Abner Costello, Woody Allen, the, the sort of verbal humor? Uh, the advantage of verbal humor uh, as opposed to nonverbal humor is that often you can get the setup done much more quickly 
And so then you get more punch lines per minute, so to speak. So we all recall probably that, that Harpo delightful harp uh, recitation where basically he's just playing so wonderfully and it takes a good minute and a half and then he yawns and the entire office laughs. But the setup is so long in order to get to that uh, nonverbal punchline. Um, <coughs> Ian talks about a, a comic he saw in Asia who came out on a bicycle that had square wheels. So, of course, it didn't work. In Asia, but it was a very effortful, long setup in order to get that going. The advantage of verbal humor is you can get the setup out in a matter of seconds, so then you can get to a punchline more quickly. And I feel like it is cerebral. It gets a lot of credit because there's so many laughs per minute, but it's still very much the same joke structure. Yeah, it's interesting. You, when you talked about that, I thought of Hitchcock and the way he would he would just pull suspense out. And some comedy is sort of like that. You pull the comedy out and you're waiting for the punchline, waiting for the punchline. Here it comes, here it comes, and then boom! And sometimes it is more effective to have that stretching. Um, Sal, uh, what is your take on sort of verbal humor? Uh, well, I mean, okay, so first one, one distinction. I wouldn't call that verbal humor. No. The, you know, we use the term verbal humor for puns and, and that kind of stuff. Um, this is more like a, an organization of, of, uh, of, of referential humor that's just different, uh, uh, different way of, of presenting it. But, okay, so having said that, um, I, I think that what Mitch said is, is, very, is very true, is, is you get the punchline much, you get to the punchline much faster, so you can pack the, the, the humor if you think of the Abbott and Costello who's on first, th there is a, a density of punchlines in that, you know, 10 second uh, uh, thing that's, ex that's extremely high. Um, and, um, you know, for, for a lot of, of genres of humor, the higher the density of the punchline, uh, the more, you know, the audience is going to recognize it. And the more it's, it's a safer thing for the comedian because um, even if you miss one, there's five other punchlines that you that you get. So, so you know, if I throw ten punchlines at the wall, probably everybody in the room will be laughing because you know at least they'll get one out, yeah. out of ten, and you know, so then everybody's laughing. So, so you get you get that kind of effect. Well, I'm going to link to all three of your websites, Mitch's and uh, Sal's uh, university sites, and AriHoppman.com as well. But I want to give you a uh, all a, a final say so, and I'll start with Sal and go uh, back with the Ari. Um, if there's anything that I have not brought up that you want to say about humor, and also what you have coming up, Sal, do you have a, a book or are you researching humor still, or what? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very much uh, researching humor. After after ten years working as an administrator, I finally came to my senses and went back to to do research, and uh, I am literally finishing the book. Uh, that uh, I'm sending to the publisher in two weeks. So we're, <laughs> we're talking like really finishing. Uh, and it's a, an introduction to the linguistics of humor, which I, mm. where I, I start from absolute zero and uh, work my way up. Uh, so look for it in the in bookstores uh, uh, soon. Are you talking about the construction of jokes? Uh, absolutely, yes. Everything that has to do with language and humor is going to be in that book. Okay. Mitch, how about you? Um, is there anything that you'd like to say that I might have missed? or And what do you have, uh, if anything in terms of research or anything regarding humor? So in the last chapters of my book, Humor 101, I do emphasize that the construction of humor and the way cognitive behavior therapy works does have some, some uh, nice parallels in the sense that you're looking at what are your thoughts and are they actually reflecting reality? You can see how a depressed person might actually take a certain set of cognitions and realize, oh wait, this is inaccurate, and suddenly start to feel better. In, in many ways, humor works uh, comparably in that I've had a faulty assumption and now I realize, oh, that is the case, and that hasn't been uh, a, a terminal accident, so that goes well. I do want to emphasize too that the the humor researchers are delighted that Dr. Otardo is back in the field, and I just really look forward to seeing his book. And Ari, uh, you look like you're in a, a cap, a submarine captain's quarters there. Well, is, is anyone gonna, is anyone ever gonna give you a sitcom or an HBO special? 
I'm, I'm, I'm available, as the man said. I, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I have, unfortunately, the, the, my, my next work uh, coming up, what I'm preparing is a, um, a, gloss, a glossaries of middle high German poems uh, and, uh, for, for, uh, for students. So uh, that, that's, uh, I think, on the list of uh, bestsellers, I think I can undercut anyone on that one. But what I was going to, what, what I was, what I was thinking about uh, over the last, uh, over some of the last couple of questions, um, something that ties a lot of this, a lot of things together. There's a video with Norm MacDonald, if you know him, um, and it's a roast of um, Bob Saget. Mm. So Norm comes out and his jokes are not working. They are, they're, you know, they're, they're roast jokes about, you know, the guest of honor. And what happens as you're watching it, you realize that he is purpose, he is confident enough and he's well known enough, that helps too, that he is purposely doing 60 year old jokes that are not funny, that have no, and, and that, you know, were probably from uh, a thousand and one jokes for a roast of your boss after dinner. And after about five minutes, the comedians in the audience realize what he's doing and they are just dying. They are rolling on the floor because they realize that he is purposely telling awful jokes. So there's, there's, I think there's a whole lot of what we talked about in the six or seven minutes, if you find that out. Yeah. If the internet still exists in the future that yeah. the people are watching. Well, I want to, I want I want to thank all three of you, uh, Sal, Mitch, and Ari, and uh, continued success to all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Indeed. Thanks.